superstar. He is an absolute superstar, Tom Mitchell. Chris at the back. Chris is too good. Neil, 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 yes! Oh, how good was that? All right, so it's time to do the Ball Magnets Grand Final podcast. I'm pretty excited for this one. There's some stories that are untold, all the behind the scenes access, which I'm sure everyone's going to be pumped to listen to. Pretty excited to relive it as well. We've got Bailey here from Ball Magnets. So for everyone wondering if I run the socials on Ball Magnets, I don't. That's not me posting my own <laughs> stats or anything. That's Bailey. <laughs> so Bailey, welcome. He's done plenty of stuff with um, you know AFL Media, Caden McDonald on YouTube as well. So he'll be facilitating... What's well, going to be an epic podcast? You sound uh, dusty, mate. What's that? You sound a bit dusty. My throat's yeah in trouble. My, I've lost my voice, mate. It's been a big, big week. It's been yeah. the best week of my life. It's fair. But um, hopefully you've got some good uh, questions for us. I'm sure you do. I'm excited. We've seen each other this morning, and I've held off. Have you? I've held off on on everything that I want to get through. Yeah. There's a lot here, so we both got our haircuts as well. We do. We're fresh. Yeah, we're fresh. We're feeling we're good. Fresh. You got um, the rolly on as well, mate. You got to. You got to you got to celebrate when you win. The rolly doesn't come out often, but uh, if it's ever going to come out, it's grand final. It's actually That's been right. the best week of my life. So, mate, whatever you got for me, throw it out because I'm sure the Pies fans or footy fans out there are going to going to love what we're about to tell them from this week. I want to start in 2015. You didn't make the final side for the grand final in 2015. You get to 2016, you lose that granny. Then you've got 2,550 days between making prelims. Is that right? That's two, yeah, 2,500 days between prelims. This is prelims. why we hired you, mate, because you do your research. That's right. <laughs> 2,500 days between prelims. Had it creeped into your mind around performing in big games and just playing in big games? And what were your thoughts around going into these games, especially with the biggest club in the league? Good questions. Um, so, yeah, that so it was 2014 where I didn't get – I got dropped in round 23. I remember the game so vividly, so – yeah, I, I remember it uh, quite clearly, sorry, because to that point in time, that was the best game I'd ever played in my career. I think, not that it's about statistics, but I had something like 30 touches, 13 tackles in round 23 to Richmond. We lost. I got dropped for the finals. Didn't get a look in. It was an emergency for the granny, which killed me. I remember watching all the boys run out and, I, you know, I, was, I should have been playing. Um you know, 2012, I, I was obviously on the list at the Swans. We missed, I missed the grand final. I was injured that year, so I was never going to play. But then 2016, you know, you you go through a final series. That was probably some of the best footy I played as well. I remember the prelim against Geelong at the MCG. That was, that's probably one of the best games I played in my career. So, um, and then, yeah, losing 2016, um, that was tough. You know, we were favourites going into that game. We probably, I reckon on reflection, got ahead of ourselves. Because we, we thought we were going to play the Giants in the grand final and we thought they were our biggest opponent, the toughest opponent, and then we played the Bulldogs. And I remember watching that game with a few mates after the Bulldogs beat the Giants in the prelim thinking we're a good chance of being premiership players here. We got too confident, I thought, um, and then we that cost us. And then, what would you say, 2,500 days before another prelim and grand final. Wow. Um, Does that creep in? Does that creep in like over the course of your career? Because that's... That's seven, eight years of of not playing in the last couple of weeks of this season. Does has did that creep in over over the course of your Hawthorne tenure? It's gonna sound like a weird answer, but it was almost like became accepted that not playing finals was just what would happen. Like we didn't play finals. We played in twenty eighteen, we finished top four, went out in straight sets, we had a great year. We had a few things that didn't go our way over the years at Hawthorne with injuries and things with key players. But I remember getting to the end of a lot of those seasons being absolutely drained and absolutely cooked, whereas chatting to Pendles and a few of the guys, Geordie, Dugowie this year, we felt we got to the end of the season. And even now, I feel like I've got more footy left in me. Mm. So there's something that Collingwood are doing in terms of keeping us mentally fresh, enjoying footy, coming to the club, loving what we do, and that gives you the mental energy to want to keep going. I feel like I've got another five games left in me easy, whereas previous years I feel as I've got to the end and I'm like, for our finals will be tough, like I'm ready to have a break. So there's definitely been a shift, but I think it's a credit to the environment. Um, just grateful to be at the Pies. It's the best. There's only been two years where you've played 26 games in a season. I think it's been 26. 
which is 2016 and then this year. But touching on going to Hawthorne and being it accepted that you're not going to play in these finals, was that a main factor in terms of you walking into that trade period? Was that on top of mind? Are you thinking, okay, turning 30, mm. I want team success? That was, having said that, you need a bit of luck. Like Collingwood wanted me. Not many other teams did. You know, I, I could have found a new home. I knew my time I was up with Hawthorne. I knew, I knew it. Um, and what, I probably, what was that? Well, I probably knew that at the start of that season. Like I would have, I wanted to stay at Hawthorne the rest of my career. I was content, happy, but, you know, certain things happen. I knew they wanted me out. You know, I knew as soon as round one, round two, it was some funny things happened. Um, I remember we, we do like, you do like the coaches do like a game rating system out of five at Hawthorne, which they put on the walls for everyone to see after a game. And it's funny, like um, I have a good laugh. I'm very close with all the Hawthorne players. We're very good mates. And round one, two, I think round one we played North. I was the only player on the team to get rated a one out of five. <laughs> round two, we had a 60 point win against Port Adelaide away. Great team win. I was the only player that got rated a two out of five or less. I only played on the whole team. The funniest thing about both those games is I think I got Brownlow votes in both games. So I played pretty well. Um, but they, there were some signs there. I'm like, this is something's going on here. This is weird. You know, there was this one particular meeting I, rem I remember, and I don't want to come across as I'm complaining. This is more just how I was feeling and how I felt I was being made to feel. Um, there was a meeting in particular, a game review, and, you know, I chat with Dylan Moore, Finn McGuinness, Will Day, these guys who are some of my good mates still. <laughs> we call it the Tom Mitchell game review where that was the sign sealed delivered. I knew after that meeting, I'm, I'm not coming back here next year. Whatever happens, I'm not coming to Hawthorne. There was a game review where there was something like five or so clips of just me. And there was a few that were fair. Like there was one passage of play where as a midfielder, we wanted to stay on the defensive side of the stoppage at forward 50 and I got caught on the other side I made a mistake little things like that but I got barreled this meeting all five clips that was the meeting done and I walked out of that thinking are you serious like this is this is um unprofessional unfair made me feel like absolute shit in front of everyone and that happened a few times um you know we've got a lot of Hawthorne staff now at Collingwood and I was chatting to Andy Otten and he remembers the meeting as well and from that point onward I, I was just I'm not coming back here and I, I loved Hawthorne and I still do, you know, I had a lot of great times there, but that was when I knew I'm not coming back here. Um, and then I guess that turned to on field as well. Like just little things were creeping in. It was just weird. Like I remember, and I understand like the big picture of where Hawthorne are going and they're probably, mm. you know, I hope it works for them and cause all my good mates are there and you know, it probably, it probably will. So good on them. That's awesome. But just little things like I remember in, um, in games like you know when you come to the bench and you get on the phone to the coaches it happens quite often and they say what are you seeing in the game you talk about well i'm saying this they're saying this and you try and dissect and like i'm going to go out there and we're going to go out there and we'll try and fix this at the stoppages and what can we do and i remember by the end i was coming to the bench and it was it was all about how many center bounce attendances i was at and yeah. how many i was allowed to go to so it was almost like a structured thing like i'm only allowed to go to i think it was the number was eight or ten for the game so I'd come to the bench and it would be I'd get on the phone or one of the coaches would be like, hey, mate, um, you've had five centre bounces, make sure you're not in there. So by the end of the time at Hawthorne, I'm thinking, I'm not even thinking about how to get better or help the team get better at footy. I'm thinking about how to get away from the game and the ball just goes against completely everything I've ever done. And it was just weird and those things crept in. And, um, you know, that, they're, they're little things that, that you pick up and you reflect back on and think, um, you know, yeah, just, just funny, but you know, it's funny how things work out, you know, like, um, you know, it's, it's been probably great for Hawthorne. A lot of the senior guys moved on and they had a great season this year. A lot of the young guys really stood up Jai and Will Day and, um, wrapped for those guys. So they're ripping blokes. Mitchie Lewis. Mitchie Lewis. Yeah. There's heaps of them. Um, and then for me, you know, I've landed at Collingwood where I'm very lucky to be. So, you know, things happen for a reason. You've touched on a lot this year about the broad scale of leadership at the Pies. As probably the most senior head in, in those later years, when you're going into a meeting and the most, or if not one of the most senior heads in the, in the team is, is the one getting 
smashed with with feedback. Yeah. Well, it wasn't the only one. Like everyone gets their fair share of feedback, and definitely, you know, sometimes it's warranted for sure. So it's not <clears throat> anything against that method of um, going about things. But um, yeah, I probably would have just preferred a conversation of just. I don't know how that works in terms of a list management point of view, whether they can actually say that because maybe they need to keep you on site in terms of to keep um, you happy so that I think the way they try and do it is that they want to make you ask to leave rather than them push you out. That's how I, I think. Well, not, they, not to name names, but was there some people there that you th were disappointed in that took it wrongly? No, nah, not really. No, it's a business. Like when you, when you realise that it's a business – I don't think there is a lot of loyalty in footy. Like, I, you know, I feel like I played some good footy at Hawks and, um, you know, I threw everything into it. I worked as hard as I possibly could. Um, everyone would know that. But um, I just didn't really feel valued at all, um, at all, you know, in terms of what I could help and contribute with to the group. And, yeah, I was, I was pretty happy when the opportunity came to come to Collingwood and um, a fresh start was exactly what I needed and, yeah, we moved 12 months forward and, you know, it's easy to say now that we've won and can celebrate and these things. But I think, you know, regardless of if we won, I'm just a much happier person um, with where I'm at in my life right now. So it's a credit to fly, to fly, to be honest. And the players for embracing me. And the first day I walked in the club, all the boys got around me. We trained together. Some of my closest mates already in the last 12 months. So I'm just pumped with how it's panned out. Wow. Okay. We've got through a bit there. I'm excited now. It's, we've settled in nicely. <laughs> so Friday 22nd, you guys beat GWS in the prelim. You follow on and watch the Blues lose to the to the Lions on the following Saturday. And then the Monday, you've got the Brownlow. And I saw your Brownlow day and night. You seem pretty calm and composed, were you? Yeah, um, I think so. Um, to be honest, the whole week I've felt calm composed whether that comes with experience so but I wasn't anxious or stressed the whole week the only thing I was slightly stressed about was I did my back in the prelim mm. in the warmer I'd, I'd have a few back issues earlier in the year and I did it literally in the warm-up just before we started the national anthem I'm like oh no why is this happening now but my body started seizing up and I, I went to the physio I was like I'm gonna I don't know if what, what I should do here like I don't want to hurt the team um and he's like, oh, what do you reckon? I'm like, I reckon I can push. Got some pain, killers on board. Got this like belt. You would have seen me, I don't know if there's footage out there, but you would have seen me strapping this belt to like hold my back in for the game. So I was pretty underdone, pretty sore for the prelim. So yeah, like to be able to play, like I was just happy to get out there and contribute for that. And then I was, I got an injection the next morning, first thing, got an epidural in my back. And so sitting at Brown and I, you know, it's not great for a back when you're sitting, but sitting, I was in a bit of pain, like still sore. So that was the only thing I was thinking about. Like, I just got to make sure as soon as this event's over, hopefully Nick wins, if not Lockie. Um, but then I just got to get out of here and just do everything possible from then on to get myself right for the granny. Um, but in terms of the preparations, like on reflection, everything felt very normal. Like even like the fanfare in terms of people rocking up to training, like it, felt pretty normal because like, the Pies fans always show up. So even the parade, like it was it was very, I don't know, don't know why. It felt like we're all in just this state of we were just ready to play and uh, we weren't too many distractions. From 2016 granny to this granny, the week in preparation, did you find yourself intentionally doing anything differently? Yeah. What were they? For sure. So – 2016, I was a super anxious person. I've got OCD, like I do have strong OCD I'd tendencies. Love to touch on that. Which which work in my favour. Like I, I'm the like you know the old saying, first in, last to leave. That's me. Like if you speak to any of the boys at the club, I, I'm at the club every every day. Downtime, like I'm in there at night sometimes. Like I, I just anything to be the best I can be. Like I'll put in more work than anyone. Which I, I which, tell everyone. I tell everyone. You're the you're a weirdo, yeah, but you're, you're the hardest working bloke I know. Yeah, it's, it's like that's, mental. That's that's what makes me good at what I do, and the things I apply myself to. But it's also my downfall in the fact that I burn so much mental energy that I get to the end of days and weeks and I'm cooked. And that's probably what I touched on earlier at Hawthorne, where I 
It's getting to the end of the season. I was just zonked, had nothing left. Whereas this year, I learned to manage, manage my mental energy better. So, like, even for example, grand final week, I reflected on 2016, how much training I did that week, how much commitments outside I did. But even you would have noticed for grand final week, I cut a few ball magnets commitments. I said, nah, I just need, I would never do that. Like, I, I'm all in every single day, you know that. Social things, didn't go out for any dinners. Just like little little things, getting out of the club earlier than I would. I would never normally do that. I almost feel uncomfortable getting out on time because I'm like, I should be doing something. Um, so, it, yeah, the thing I changed the most was saving my mental energy for game day. Do you think winning, a, a winning season helps you stay more motivated than a season at the Hawks like you did <clears> in those last couple? Yeah. Like Sydney, we had some really strong teams too. I think like our group, what I can say about a number of our players is – We've got so many guys that are so dedicated and that love training. So motivation isn't an issue. Like I look at the Dacos boys, Quainor, Brazzy Maynard, Pendles. You could name another 10 guys who love what they do. And so I know the group's going to be motivated. It's just how the guys are wired. Like you've already seen Quainor start training already. Like <laughs> There's, um, he's built different. But Even you the other day, it was I think it was – You'd, you'd had three days since the game, so it'd been the fourth day after the granny, and you messaged me, and you said, I said, like, I won't hassle you with heaps of stuff, heaps of shit coming your way, ball magnets-wise. And you said, no, nah, I'm ready to go. Like, yeah. I'm ready to get back to work. Well, I think, yeah, always, like, it's good to have a, a little bit of a break. You need that, but um, you're always going to be chasing something. Yeah, I guess, um, I don't know, from a, a team point of view, like, I know that this group has more success in them. I, you know, I firmly believe that and I think we've got the work ethic to do it. They're, they're not easy to win. Making finals isn't easy, let alone getting to a grand final. So we can't get complacent. We can't get ahead of ourselves. Like Fly's been big on preaching, being humble. Like, you know, we obviously really want to enjoy the good times. Like you have to because this is a once in a lifetime. You have to celebrate and be stoked and things, but you got to be have a humble element in the background as well and um, be ready to go again. But from a personal point of view, like, I felt it's been a bit of the story of my whole career. Like I've felt as though I've never been rated externally. And so that doesn't bother me. Like this whole year, like I sacrifice a lot this year with my individual game in terms of like, I know I can go out there and get 35 touches a game. Like I, I've, that's what my strength has been as a player, but I, I fully just wanted to buy into like, what can I do to help this team win? And that was, that was purely around contests you know, I didn't really play for any uncontested ball. It was all contested ball, tackle, contested possession, clearance, get the ball to Geordie, get the ball to Nick, get the ball to Josh. Sacrifice all my nut. I didn't care about it. I just wanted to win. And it, I think we've got so many players that do that. But, yeah, I feel as though I've never been rated. And so that, that chip on my shoulder is never going to go away. I'm sure next year I'll have a bad game. The media will happily write me off again. And... I'll, um, you know, not that you play for their validation because I don't, but it was just more proving to myself that I know the work I put in and I know who I am as a player and as a person. I messaged you, and you would have had a, your phone blowing up, but I messaged you and my message was after the game, your legacy is cemented. Do you feel, obviously you keep wanting to chase success. No, that doesn't stop. How, how does this validate your career up till this point or, or do you find it validating yeah. People ask me after the brown loaf that was life changing. It wasn't. This feels life changing. Yeah. Because of the bonds that are created for the rest of our life. We're sharing this with people. It's validation for literally thirty years of like hard, hard, hard work. And you never know if you're gonna to get to this point. So it does feel like some form of validation. Having said that, like I want want to keep going. Like there's it's never a full stop on anything you do. So um yeah, it's uh it's just such a special thing to be a part of. The premiership is by far the best thing I've ever been a part of in footy. All right, let's go to game day. Fly's message pre-game, you said, was was pretty special. Yep. And it's been documented on already, the the riding inside your jumpers. Can you touch on that? Sure. Um, so Fly's pre-game address, first of all, was they're always unbelievable. They're special. Like there's always a bit of humour in there, like – like far out. They have the boys in stitches every time we, before we play a game, which relaxes everyone. It's a great way to go about it. And then he, no one had really shared what their legacy word was within their jumpers. I think a few have been released publicly now. 
um, Flies was 44 sons because he pretty much loves us like his 44 sons. That's how he treats us and we feel that too. Like he's like a father figure for us. Um, mine was very simple. Mine was just tough. That's all one word, tough. <laughs> I like to keep things pretty simple. Um, you know, there's some other ones like Bobby was the pressure king. Pendles was a mama mentality in tribute to Kobe, Kobe Bryant. That's pretty cool. So many really cool ones. But Fly's pregame address was about um, he had his baby, Maggie, that morning, 7.45 a.m. So he said to us, boys, this is already the best day of my life. Whatever happens, go out there, give it your best shot. Um, but if you can do it, it'll definitely be the best day of my life. So. And the postgame speech? Oh, I can't remember the postgame. Post games are blurred to be honest, but yeah, the pre-game he mentioned that, and then he also mentioned his um, his partner Gabby didn't even tell him that she was about to give birth because she wanted him to have a good good sleep. So that's amazing, unbelievably selfless from her. But Fly obviously would have loved that to be there all night at the hospital with Gabby. But um, oh, it says a lot about the people involved in our footy club. Um, just yeah, super super grateful to be a part of this culture and, and fly a lot of a uh, credit that to him. He's just, you know, just such a great guy. Got me to the pies and couldn't be happier. So you walk out. What I picked up on straight away was it seemed like the whole team was smiling. It seemed like everyone was really happy to be there. Was that before the game? Before the game, <laughs> before the game. It seemed, it seemed as, as so, is that? Yeah. So that's the environment that's been created. Fly is a believer that happy players produce results um we were actually doing our signing session yesterday and i was standing there with flyer we we're just reflecting we we're looking at the poster of the team photo from on the ground before we play the game so you know they put the two benches out yep. every i don't know whether you go back and look at photos of history every single one of our players is smiling yeah everyone's so like good. big smiles i reckon if you go back and look i'm only guessing but at teams in previous years and this is only just collingwood's way of doing it so there's obviously a lot of ways that work but to be a lot of serious faces. Yeah. I'm probably one of the guys that's struggling to smile. I've got yeah. my mouth guard in. Geordie yeah. to go, he was taking the piss out of me. He's like, mate, why do you have your mouth guard in? And I was like, well, look at Coxie. He's got his goggles on still. Yeah. Coxie's at the back, blue steel. He's probably the only one not smiling. Everyone else is wrapped to be out there on grand final day. So it's been something different because I've always been a serious operator. The way I got my footy, very disciplined, dedicated. I can have a good laugh off the field. Like I'm, you know. Um, with my mates and stuff but when it came to footy I was very ruthless and that's one thing a shift I made this year is being able to find patches in the game before the game during the breaks to have a laugh or to take a moment to take in the atmosphere of the stadium which I'd never done before this year I want to if there's any moments that you want to touch on just throughout the game we can but I, I would I want to go to fourth quarter so I I think you came out in that fourth quarter, especially that last sort of three minutes and iced the game. You had a couple of huge moments and everyone had, I think, known you would have you were having a pretty big impact on the game. But that last three minutes, I think I was like, shit, like you're, you're on everything. So five minutes left in the game, Cameron kicks his goal yeah, and you go off. Yeah. You go off at that point. And then you get the instant reply from Geordie, Steele kicks his thump from 50 and then another one straight after that mm. Danaher and that's when you come back on as soon as Danaher kicks that goal so I remember when my rotation came like I was ready I needed to come off there was um there was a patch earlier in the last quarter maybe 15 minutes in and it's like I've never like some players occasionally if they're gassed they would just come off but I, I've never done that and I was the closest I've ever come to like I need to get like I was so cooked like the heat like you're playing to exhaustion, like throwing yourself at every contest. And I was cooked, but I was like, nah, just, you just got to, we could somehow push it out and every player's the same. But, um, so I remember that. I remember when Cameron kicked that goal, that was the first time of the game. I was like, oh shit. That was the first time of the game. I always thought we we're going to win, but that was the first time I got worried. Cause you go down by four at that point. Yeah. It was at four. Four points. Or, or two, 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 two points. Yeah. Went to the bench. It was pretty calm. Our bench is pretty calm. Flyers are relaxed. And I think that's, pass on to the players we're pretty relaxed and then for Jordy to kick that goal in that moment just to like ease some pressure I was like far out so happy these guys on our team yeah. Nick Handler on it to him Pendles is in there too and then Steele's goal was clutch 
don't know how an old man like that kicked a goal ball 50 metres at the end of the game. And then, yeah, I, I come on. It was my last burst of energy, so. You jumped on everything. You jumped on what I everything. came on for. But, yeah, I remember the last thing. It was just you, just, you just leave it all out there. It's a grand final. The reward's there if you want it. I remember that quote from Adam Goods. He hurt his knee in the 2012 granny, and he said, the reward's are there if you want it. And that's what I was, that was the quote I was telling in my head all day. Kept telling myself, this is so tough, but the reward's are there if you want it. So that's, that's all I was telling myself going towards every contest. Um, and I remember they actually wanted me, the message from the coach upstairs, Hayden Skitworth, was he wanted me in this defensive position um, of the stoppage because Pendles was going to drop behind the play. I was going to be the, the next guy, the defensive guy. Sweeper? Yeah. Yeah, kind of like that, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, and then we always sort of manipulate things out there. Um, but I, I sort of had a role in Lockie Neal that day as well. I want to touch so on this as well. I, I was torn between do I go to Lockie or do I go to the defensive position? And so I, I sort of made the call myself. I'm like, Lockie is the one that could win the game for him. So he's a superstar, best player, one of the best players in the comp. I was like, I think I have to go to Lockie. That was the call I made out there. So the stoppage, you'll see I direct. I think it's Geordie. I said, you get to the sweeper spot. I'll, get, I'll look after Neil. Um, and then I think I must have got a free kick for too high. With yes, maybe thirty yeah, seconds to go, yeah. I, I, that's when I that's when I thought we've we've won the game. And then you hit a kick, and then um, so I, I kicked it backwards to Pendles, yeah. and I don't know what happened, but he either, either got played on, or he either played on. I got called to play on. He I asked him about it. He said he should have got fifty meters. He reckons Zorko overstood the mark, but luckily he was able to use some deception and chipped it back to me. You found yourself I, in some space, actually. Right yeah, there. well, I think. Small. I think they went they went to free, man up the other three players and I got free there. And then I knew when I got that, I'd guys screaming at me, but it was pretty composed. Like I knew I could see the sign to my left. There was 30 seconds on the clock. The 30 sign, so that means there's less than 30 seconds. I'm like, okay, if I can ice the game, I'll chip sideways to my check. And then I'm like, okay, if he can ice another 10, we go down the line, we can't lose. Yeah. And that's what I knew. But then running to my defensive position of – the long down the line kick. We've all got our spots where we kick down the line where you have to be in your spot for defence. Um, I was there and I, I don't <laughs> then when the siren went, it was just like I couldn't control my body. It was like out of body experience. Like there's this footage, which is my favourite footage of the whole grand final. Me and Nick Dacos were in sync. We dropped to our knees at the same time. We did the exact same pose. And the clip doesn't pan out, but we both fall flat on our face. Yeah. And then guys jump on each other. But that was the most euphoric thing I've ever felt in my life. You had head in hands. I, I didn't know what you were doing. Either. I didn't know what I was doing either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just rolling around. Actually, one funny thing about this, Billy Frampton jumped on me. And if you look at footage of Steele, he was on the far wing running around by himself in circles. Then Steele <laughs> jumps on me and we're all rolling around. And then Billy Frampton jumps off me onto Steele. And then Steele goes... Billy, get the fuck off me. I'm fucking cramping. So he's pushing, he's actually pushing Billy off. But then, yeah, everyone was just gassed, but you're just celebrating with whatever you've got left to get around the boys. There's a, there's a couple of great pieces of footage of you after the game in the rooms as well with your family. That's an amazing video. I loved that. You said about Lockie before, um, you had matched up on him in round 22, I believe, or round 21. It yeah, was, he dominated us that game. But so so that, there was a bit of discourse around you matching up on him that game, and I think the general consensus was that he got the rub of the green. But you had 31 that day, and he had 31. So. No, he played better. He was the best player on the ground. Either way, the, the discourse was that you were matching up on, on him and trying to, trying to negate him, and then people said that he got the rub of the green on you. And then you go into this game, firstly, was that back of mind? Secondly... Did you change your way of approaching Lockie? So we're great mates, which, um, yeah, which it's always hard playing on a mate because you, you can't really be as ruthless as you want to be because you're good mates. And I think Lockie and I will eventually do a pod and dissect this grand final. Like he's a ripper guy, like such a great bloke, superstar player, but superstar bloke. So, um, but we were at each other grand final today, like, and to be honest, it was mostly me. I was being a bit of a prick. I was pretty ruthless and it was just, I knew that I had to do whatever I could to try and stop Lockie. Did you go a, into the game with that? In yeah, I had mind? to. I had to. Did, did, was that from coaches? Myself. Yeah. Yeah. I had to. Um, and, you know, I actually had to send him a message after the game. It was just like, mate, I'm 
I hope you know I love you. Um, you know, everything today was purely about footy as a granny. We had to do whatever we could to win. Um, you know, and I would never say anything personal. I've never done that in my life on a footy field. But um, it was more just it was such a ruthless approach about going about it with a mate. And to his credit, great character. He texted me back saying, brother, all good, completely understand, grand final, don't stress, enjoy. And then we spoke on the phone probably a few days later after the dust was settled and I, I was I was worried that I'd lost a mate. Um, but, you know, shows his character as well and his understanding. So, um, you know, Lockie, you know, won another brown though, what a freak. Um, and I'm sure his chance of a premiership is going to come because he's too good not to win one. Um, but, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited, you know, about – what we can still do together with ball magnets with Cripper and Gids because, you know, I think Lockie and I at some point we do a podcast and really dissect the granny. Um, yeah, and you're still a great mate. Love it, Tommy. I think that's us done unless there's any special moments that that you think um, are the things you're going to look back on and, and really be fond of. Nothing. I think we've covered it all. Like, I'm sure there's thousands of things we've, things we've missed. There'll be more to come out. There'll be more to come um, as time goes on and we'll reflect even more, but... Um, just, um, yeah, it's been a crazy week. As you can tell, my voice, I've lost my voice. But um, I think it's got better during this. Has it? Good. I think. Just um, super grateful um, to be a part of Collingwood Footy Club. And even though I've only been here for a lot, uh, for one year, I consider myself a pie for life now. I think Collingwood is my club. You know, they've um, welcomed me with open arms and just keen to keep repaying the faith as much as I can. I love this club. So um, just so grateful and so happy in life at the moment. Love it, Tommy. Good work, Good work.